This video is supported by EmuDB, the lightweight, high-speed immutable database for systems and applications. Hello everybody and welcome back to the Moshix mainframe channel. This is Moshix. In 1965, IBM released the famous OS360 operating system, which was in many ways a huge innovation because now you had the operating system as the centerpiece of the computer and applications were written for the operating system. Before that, there were some sorts of operating system, but mainly the applications were controlling the machine. From there, uh, we know that uh, IBM also released it, of course, at the same time, the famous IBM S360 mainframe, which uh, had 32-bit uh, uh, addressing and uh, the famous 8-bit byte innovation. After that, IBM released, a, in 1967, a slightly revised version called MVT. And at the same time, from the same source, you could either build M MVT or MFT, still on the IBM S360 mainframe. The innovation of MVT and MFT were that you could now partition memory in more or less intelligent ways so that you could run several applications at the same time. MFT was a parallel development, which then resulted in in innovation around 1972 called OS VS1. And that is a branch of the mainframe operating system which does not exist today. The branch that continued into today's modern age was this branch here. And so from OS 360, IBM released, and as I said, MVT, later on, uh, something called OS VS2, which uh, was also called already back at the time, MVS for multiple virtual storage. And together with that announcement, or more or less at the same time, uh, IBM had to release a new architecture or improved architecture called S370, which of course had virtual memory support as well as uh, protection of address spaces. Then in 1980, IBM productized MVS SP further, and that's why it's called SP for uh, I think it's for service product. I'm not too sure anymore what SP stands for. Or system product, uh, MVS system product, which was released at the same time as some new mainframes, a whole new class of mainframes with a whole new electronics architecture called IBM 3081, 3083, and 3084. A 3084 was basically two 3081s attached together, so you could run it as one machine or as two separate machines. I started working myself in the military on an IBM 3083BX with 16 megabytes of memory on which about three, 4,000 people were working at the same time. So just to give you perspective of how powerful these machines were back then as perceived by us in the 80s. Uh, MVS SP had, uh, next to the operating system itself, had a lot of advancements such as a very capable communications architecture called VTAM. It had RACF for security and many other things around security and communication that made this a much more robust operating system that you could also start to deploy and make it face um, uh, worldwide communications. Then in 1983, and I was already around during this time here, um, so I remember the passage from MVS SP to MVS XA very well. This was still a 24-bit operating system, so all this was only able to uh, address 24-bit, meaning 16 megabytes of memory. Although we didn't know at the time, but some of these machines already had the capability to go beyond 24-bit, but IBM never described it to the users. But when they announced then in 1983 MVS XA, which was a 31-bit operating system and a vastly improved I.O. architecture, so you could process I.O. much faster, we understood that some of these machines already were capable of running XA. And at the same time, IBM also announced a whole new architecture called the 3090, um, which at the time was a giant machine. They could go up to uh, 64 or 128 megabytes of memory, which seemed so huge at the time. I remember the announcement 3090. Yet also some 4381 machines, which were primarily running at the time VM uh, or DOS, which we're not talking about in this video, uh, but of course is another line of operating systems by IBM for the mainframe. Some of them are also capable of running 31-bit uh, uh, operating system so that you could run MVS XA. So uh, these machines were capable of supporting the 31-bit operating system, MVS XA. And then um, at the time, because, because of the introduction of 
31 bit and because of the architecture of MVS itself and as I have described in a pre previous video there were some constraints because some stuff still needed to run below 16 megabytes of memory so some stuff still needed to run in 24 bit and to alleviate the problem IBM in 1988 uh, released a new version of MVS called EM MVS ESA for extended, extended system architecture which still ran mostly on the 3090 machines which uh, gave you some solutions to somewhat alleviate the problem of, uh, of not having enough virtual memory to run the applications. Then in 1995 IBM changed the name from MVS to OS 390. So that's the only thing, it's really just a change of name. Um, it's still 31-bit. It had some new capabilities, especially it had some new compilers and of course all the other subcomponents such as communications, uh, databases all received of course upgrades too, but it's really just a name change from MBS ESA to OS 390. It's almost like a uh, facelifting a little bit and going back to the name OS um, and 390 of course standing for the 90s. IBM at the time also announced a new mainframe, the ES9000 and I actually never worked on this line of mainframes um, because there I was by then out of the mainframe uh, area and uh, these machines were capable of addressing in 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 real memory so not virtual memory we were still stuck at 2 gigabytes because 31 bit can only address uh, up to 2 gigabytes but they were the hardware itself was sometimes able to address significantly um, uh, higher amounts of memory and then uh, the big change came then in the year 2000 when IBM announced a whole new additional architecture um, uh, that was able to go to 64-bit and with that came hundreds of new instructions and so the change from 24-bit to 31-bit was actually not as big as the change from 31-bit to 64-bit to because that really required a whole new uh, way of uh, working internally and um, and also at the time then announced 64-bit uh, capable processes and machines called the Z machines uh, uh, or uh, Z nah, they had several several models there maybe about 15 18 models since the year 2000 and of course the latest uh, release now is the Z15 which is now a, pr a mainframe with hundreds of uh, processors um, I think um, in the three four hundred processes and many many terabytes of addressable RAM and of course encryption and uh, and uh, compression built in very advanced features for the enterprise so uh, we have here a history going from all the way from 1965 with the OS 360 announcement which was revolutionary at the time and the introduction of the 8-bit byte and um, all the way down through MBT, OS 3, OS VS2, MVS, MVS SP, MVS XA which was of course 31-bit and then uh, and then OS 390 and ZOS. Today we are at ZOS 2.4 which has containers built in, which has Linux compatibility built in and many new things which back only 10 years ago seemed impossible. So now that we've seen what is the history of the uh, MVS and ZOS operating systems for the mainframe and of course as I said we're not talking here at all, at all about VM and ZVM and ZVSE and DOS all those are parallel families of operating systems with all their descendants but we're focusing here on MVS and ZOS and there's been a lot of confusion about that and a lot of people have written me and just every I would say every couple of weeks somebody says I didn't realize that MVS and ZOS are related they thought they're completely new uh, or different um, operating systems no there you will feel and I will show it in this video you will feel right at home switching from MVS to ZOS they're very very similar so now that we've seen the the history of it let's jump in and see how this uh, how it, what the differences are between MVS from 35 or 38 years ago and the modern day ZOS and and what are the substantial differences of these two operating systems of the same lineage same descend descendants of each other but of course uh, vastly improved vastly changed over the last 30 40 years all right so in this video we're going to cover three aspects of a comparison between MVS of the 80s and ZOS of the 2020s and that's the aspect of legal 
implications of running one or the other operating system, especially from the viewpoint of the enthusiast community and from the uh, viewpoint of the student and developer communities, as well as the technology that's behind it. Uh, how are these two operating systems different and what can you do with one or the other? And then we'll focus at the end um, also at the look and feel, how can you see where can you see the differences in each other? So these are the three areas that we cover, and uh, let's focus on the legal aspects for now. All right, so I have here on my screen on the left side, I have a terminal connected to MVS 3.8 from the early 80s. And on the right side, I have a terminal connected to a modern day ZOS 2.3 running on a real mainframe at the uh, University of Leipzig in Germany. And, uh, and so there are almost, I wanna say almost exactly 37, 38 years apart from each other. And, uh, and we're gonna look at, as I said, at first at the legal implications of running one or the other. And so at this point, I think I wanna make maybe the, the clearest statement I'm gonna make in this video at this time now. And that is today in, in uh, June 2020, the only legal way to run a, a modern IBM mainframe operating system such as ZOS is to run it on IBM hardware. There is no other legal way to run it. And, uh, and if, you, if any of the people think that they can or should run any ZOS uh, operating system on anything but IBM hardware, then they are infringing on the license of the of the software, uh, the license for the use of ZOS. The license says very clearly, you can only run this operating system on a hardware that was produced or made by IBM, and you need to enter an agreement with IBM to be built for the use of ZOS by peak usage or it used to be peak usage now, it's changed just recently again, but uh, you cannot buy ZOS, you can get a permanent license. The only way to get it uh, to run legally is to obtain from IBM after they go through a very thorough uh, process to even accept a customer to, um, to be able to grant the license to use ZOS on their hardware. And um, it, it, it is also important to understand there's three different aspects um, of intellectual property when it comes to software. And those three, I see confused almost every single day on the various mailing lists for IBM and, and for many other mailing lists. And it's very important to keep those three apart. One is patents. IBM, of course, without any shadow of a doubt, owns the patents to the ZOS, to the inventions inside ZOS. That's one thing. The second thing is copyright. Copyright is a law that protects the original author of something that was written, text or video or some content. And so IBM, of course, owns the copyrights to the ZOS operating system and the source code that's in there. But I, I don't think anybody is disputing that and and uh, I'm not aware that there is any copies of the source code of ZOS floating around on the internet. The third aspect is what we're concerned here with, and that's when I'm saying the legality aspect of it. The third part of any software is the license to use. Even when you buy a, you know, when, you, when people say, I, I bought, um, copy of Office 365, or I bought a copy of, um, of Windows 10. You didn't really buy Windows 10, you didn't really buy Office, you bought a license to use that software because the property and the possession of that software remains with the software company that made the software. So in this case, IBM owns the rights and own, has possession and property of ZOS. And so when when companies and banks and airlines and governments, they pay IBM for ZOS, they're not paying to, to buy it, they're paying for the license to use it. And so these three aspects of any software, which is patents, which uh, talks about the inventions in the software, and then the copyright, who owns the soft, the source code, and number three is the license to give people a license to use, and so IBM only gives a license to use 
to customers it chooses to accept and that is of course their right they don't have to accept any customer i'm sure if the north korean uh, government wanted to get a license for the us ibm would not give it to them um, or any a, a criminal enterprise um, and the and then once they accept a customer you can only run this uh, software on on an ibm mainframe the university of leipzig of course has an ibm mainframe and they're soon going to be swapping for a more powerful one but uh, they have a license to use because they have an ibm mainframe now on the left side here of my monitor i have mvs 3.8 mvs 3.8 and that is very crucial to understand is not really open source in the sense that we understand modern open source the reason why we can legally use MVS 3.8 on an emulator such as Hercules is because of a landmark antitrust deal between IBM and the US government, the federal government back in the 60s, uh, resulting from an antitrust lawsuit, which, um, which uh, forced IBM to give uh, anybody who wanted to the access to, to MVS 3.8. And that, of course, uh, is different from MVS SP, as we saw earlier in the video. So we have MVS 3.8 um, in the public domain, if you wish to use that term, even though maybe it's not strictly correct in the, in the legal terms of the antitrust settlement between IBM and the federal government of the 60s. But you can think of it as in the public domain uh, because of that antitrust settlement. And the other reason is that certain parts of MVS 3.8 and earlier operating systems, which we use also in MVS 3.8, stem from a research done by um, IBM and paid for by NASA or other federal agencies. Um, and which make those parts uh, become um, public domain by default because the US taxpayers pay for it. So that is the reason why we can legally, without any shadow of a doubt, we can run legally MVS 3.8, and we're protected here by, uh, by uh, settlements between IBM and the federal government. We can run MVS 3.8 on anywhere we want. That includes on a on a you know if you can find one working a mainframe from the 70s or 80s from ibm or you can run it on any emulator such as the hercules emulator and we've been talking about the hercules emulator how to set it up etc on windows and on linux extensively in this channel all righty now that we made it very clear what the legal differences are of mvs 3.8 and zos and the implications legal uh, implications of running one versus the other let's look at the technology behind it and uh, and how they differ from each other to understand the technology differences between mvs 3.8 and zos we have to put the two in perspective of time mvs 3.8 was released in the early 80s when uh, machines had a maximum of maybe, uh, I want to say a very big maximum, maybe was about 16 megabytes of memory or even less, 8 megabytes of memory. And memory was extremely expensive. And tape was the cheapest medium back then. And the disks were somewhere in between tape and memory in expense, uh, going down rapidly, but still very, very expensive. And, and also at the time in the early 80s, the big phenomenon back then was online work. So uh, organizations and governments, they were switching from batch processing, either through tape or punch cards or any other means, and start to involve the knowledge workers in the offices and also sometimes people in warehouses, etc., to use uh, an online approach, meaning that you didn't have to send in a form and then you would get maybe three, four days later in some result, another a printout or something, or new punch cards. Um, I remember that when I started in the military in the beginning, I had to file punch cards. So um, the archive of whatever we were, the information we were storing was stored in punch cards so that the, the we, would, we would make changes um, and then they would be processed by typists and then in the data center and then they would produce new punch cards punch new punch cards and we would get those and put them and file them in the in the archive and uh, and there was a card attached behind the punch card which had the printout in human 
uh, readable form of what was on the punch card. And so, uh, but then later on, they started to install monitors on the desks of, of, uh, of, of knowledge workers, as they were called back then, humans. And uh, instead of having to say, hey, we acquired, I don't know, let's say an insurance company, I signed up these 10 policies and then send them in and then the typist would type them in and then send back reports or uh, a printout saying the policies were registered. Now there would be, in an, in an insurance agency maybe, there would be three or four screens or not everybody would have one. And then they would have a form presented on them on the screen and people would type in the new policies themselves. And so the online work was just starting to happen back then and became a huge phenomenon later in the mid 80s and of course prevalent uh, to this day, maybe in slightly different form because now we use web uh, forms, etc. But still online processing became huge. And, uh, and so at the time when MVS 3.8 was released, the maximum addressable physical memory was was 16 megabytes because MVS uh, 3.8 was written with 24-bit addressing and I have another video uh, which I will link to below in the description below this video on on how, on the bit sizes as they as, as the bitness change from MVS 3.8 through OS 3.90 and ZOS and so because 16 megabytes was at the time a huge amount of memory and when MVS 3.8 and OS 360 were developed, people didn't think that they would uh, hit the 16 megabytes uh, uh, line or the limit of memory very soon. But they did much, much sooner than they thought. And so uh, MVS 3.8 is a 24-bit operating system. That means it can only address up to 16 megabytes of memory. Still, uh, to put it into perspective, when I was working in the military on, a, on an IBM mainframe, it was at the time an IBM mainframe 3081BX uh, with MVS SP. They were on that machine uh, about, uh, if I remember correctly, I think up to about, uh, I want to say 100 that I knew of developers, why well, was one of them. And then there were about 3,000 uh, online users on the same machine. And we had a development environment and test environment and production environment, so through three environments on the same machine with one CPU and 16 megabytes of memory all working together. And that machine never went down. It just kept on going. And of course, it was a very, very busy machine. It was always running at 97, 98% CPU usage and 100% disk capacity usage. But uh, nobody ever complained about it because they said, well, we bought the mainframe to run it at 100%. Why would we buy something to run it at 10% capacity? And in today's world, it's a little different when people buy a server and they see it running at 30% capacity, start to freak out. We need to buy the next one because this is, uh, back then people said we bought, they paid millions of dollars to use it, not to see it uh, stay unused. And so at the time, MVS 3.8 was not paid by by usage, it was paid for by sub subscription almost. You had to pay IBM a yearly fee to uh, to use MVS 3.8. And there were several components already back then. One of them, very important, was VTAM, which is the one that controls terminals and allows people to have uh, access with the terminals. Another one was the RECF uh, protection so that you could protect users from each other and not give anybody uh, read and write access to data sets. Let's remember that MVS 3.8 does not include a file system. And ZOS itself also doesn't, strictly speaking, not include a file system. It does have file systems under its Unix um, environment. So as you know, ZOS has a USS uh, Unix system um, uh, environment uh, underneath it. So you can log in and be in a Unix environment with your SSH connection or telnet connection and there of course you have a POSIX compliant file system but MVS 3.8 doesn't have a file system itself it has ways to access the disks but um, a lot of the things that are automatic in Windows and Linux in the allocations of where to put files etc is much more manual in, in MVS 3.8 as well as ZOS itself. Um, VSAM was also a very important uh, uh, component released with MVS 3.8 and we can see it here if we go to any any uh, volume on uh, ZOS, uh, oh, so, uh, sorry, on MVS 3.8 uh, let's go 
to a disk called pub 000, we will see that at the very top there is a catalog, which is kind of like the directory, and the catalog itself is a vSAM object. So from that we can see that uh, MVS 3.8 is, uh, is actually uh, including vSAM. Uh, let's see here. Okay, so the last file on this disk or data set, um, as you can see here from the VS structure here, organization VS, is a vSAM. So MVS 3.8 included catalogs in vSAM. And catalogs are a very important component of MBS and ZOS. And to this day, there is catalogs, which are, as the word says, a catalog of what's on a disk. And uh, catalogs have, involve, have evolved quite a bit from MBS all the way to ZOS. They are still in vSAM in today's world, but they're not compatible to each other anymore because a lot of improvement has gone into catalog management, caching, etc., etc. Uh, one aspect I want to mention here, which is completely different than modern operating systems, is the mapping of files. When you open up a file in, in MVS, uh, sorry, in um, Windows or in Linux, you're not really reading the whole file into memory. What's happening is that the file system um, is mapped into, meaning that only the parts of the file that are really needed at that moment, because you're opening them and you know, looking at them or you were doing something, they're read into memory. So there is not, it's not like you're reading the whole file in and then you work on it. And there is the mmap function of, of, of Unix, in the case of Linux, is invoked to have a window onto a file. And as, as you scroll down, that window inside the program that looks at the file is scrolled up and down as well. So uh, in a way, all File, access, file system access on Windows and Linux is cached because it's all mapped into memory. This is not the same with MBS and to my knowledge also with ZOS. Those are not strictly speaking mapped. There's no mapping of the file system because there is in a way no file system. So uh, this is a very different approach here on MBS 3.8 and ZOS that um, there is no mapping of the file. There is some parts of ZOS which can cache certain very important data sets. Um, and there is, a, uh, there is a, an address space in ZOS that does the caching of important and frequently accessed data sets. But in the MVS 3.8, there's no such thing. Um, and as I said, also one aspect of, um, of MVS 3.8 is that as delivered standard, there is no security whatsoever. So any user can open any data set, any user could change uh, parameter of uh, data sets and render the machine unbootable or un IPLable in mainframe terms. So those things are still quite primitive here. But as I said, I had about um, three, four hundred users on this machine here and they're all working quite happily with each other and, uh, and that's all fine. Now, uh, one aspect where actually MBS 3.8 is much better than modern day ZOS is that there's a lot of compilers that exist for MBS 3.8, which do not exist anymore for ZOS. Uh, as you can see here, for instance, we have Pascal, we have uh, Algol, we have um, RPG, we have uh, certain, a lot of other compilers and languages for which we have a compiler um, on MVS 3.8, because those languages were still used, such as BASIC, for instance, were still used heavily in the 80s. And nowadays on ZOS, they are, have mostly disappeared. On ZOS, we really have four languages mo mostly. And those are very clearly COBOL, PL1, C, and Assembler. Everything else is kind of almost an optional, and you will very rarely see those running on a modern day mainframe. ZOS, on the other hand, modern day ZOS is, is in many ways um, quite different from MBS. First of all, we need to understand um, where ZOS is being run today. ZOS is being run where there is a lot of, um, a lot of records to be processed um, or a lot of transactions to be processed every single day. So this is almost like it's a throughput oriented operating system. It's not so much a usability or, or a, um, an, an operating system targeted at interactive 
um, handling and uh, you know all the latest languages etc it's really really targeted where you have a huge amount of transactions or records to be processed every day so uh, as such you have very important components of zos which are not in mvs 3.8 db2 a lot of people i get this uh, question almost every month do we have db2 and mvs 3.8 no there is db2 even the very first version of db2 even it is first of all not licensed to run on mbs so you cannot legally run it but even if it was uh licensed it wouldn't run because mbs 3.8 does not have the dual address space feature which is required even by the very first version of of uh, db2 there is a version a very early version version of uh, dl1 which is IMSDB somewhere floating on the internet and I had a copy of it once but I lost it again uh, which you could run legally on MBS 3.8 and I managed to get it to run so I could do some PL DL1 uh, development so the the uh, the, um, the uh, one of the databases of IBM from the 60s and 70s uh, but here on ZOS you have DB2 you have of course Oracle and many other databases from other vendors you have Kix, which is a very important online processing uh, environment uh, still used very heavily by a lot of, uh, of a lot of companies I know some companies they have a billion transactions a day so you can <laughs> have environments where you process 1 billion uh, uh, requests by people on on monitors and web sessions every single day and when you have this kind of a uh, workload 1 billion transactions a day uh, things three things become very important reliability security and availability so you want of course let's start with the reliability you want transactions to always you know you want you would ideally like to have all your transactions to finish and always finish the same way and being able to count on them that you always finish in a certain amount of time that's reliability the second part security is just as important in today's world so you uh, the ibm mainframe is the only environment which has end-to-end -end encryption from the disks to the to the processing to the uh, telecommunications uh, the data is always encrypted and um and so uh, and that is all accelerated by hardware cards so that's one more aspect of the modern mainframe there's a lot of additional hardware that goes into a mainframe such as encryption compression which is really not part of uh, and that's very proprietary of course by ibm and of course even also under export control so that we can't have those things on mvs 3.8 and the third part is availability which means that uh, you want an uptime that is measured in maybe a few minutes of downtime per year and uh, i've been mainframe because of the it's almost like an airplane you know that an airplane has always at least three or four of everything um, three um, uh, electricity buses three generators three uh, compasses so everything is always at least two or three times on an airplane or four times sometimes and the same thing with a with a modern mainframe everything is redundant and there is even uh, a, and because ibm controls the software stack and the hardware stack they can do amazing things like for instance they have a battery in every mainframe that is able to finish a transaction and then shut down the mainframe if power goes off so there they they will they will they will the mainframe will will uh, cooperate between the operating system and the hardware and the battery so that the transactions in flight are processed and written to disk and then the shutdown happens in an orderly fashion so that no transactions are lost so th of course this feature is part part of it of it sits in the reliability and part of that sits in the availability and of course part of it also sits in the serviceability so ibm has this ras concept reliability availability and uh, serviceability and uh, and i add security as one of those so uh, those are th that is very much part of zos today the other part of zos is that it is very large scale you will have uh, hundreds or thousands of uh, petabytes of data controlled by zos and you will have many many thousands of users and all those things need to work with the availability reliability and speed that you needed to process a single workload day every single day 
so those things are different and of course the us has now moved to do all that is now 64-bit operating system and, and one aspect of zos which has also increased quite a lot is that um, zos is one of the very first operating systems that i know of that includes a hierarchical storage management which means that it automatically migrates data sets between the between the fastest storage and the and the slowest long-term storage such as tape devices and other means so that you will always you don't have to worry so much where where the data set resides it automatically finds the data set and puts it in the most economic part of the storage landscape that COS controls the other part of uh, MVS is that it has a workload management um, facility meaning that it automatically tunes itself and it automatically respects certain business uh, priorities assigned to certain workloads so maybe online is more important than batch or at night batches may be more important than online and so all those things are automated by the workload management of IBM and finally you have very extensive security uh, again something we don't have in MVS 3.8 which controls every single aspect everything is recorded in the mainframe every single action every file opening every file deleting every access every connection coming in everything is extensively logged and recorded and um, and auditors and of course in all those banks and governments there's very extensive risk management and audit departments and they query those things actively all the time and there is dozens of people sometimes hundreds of people dedicated in those environments to making sure that nobody accesses wrong information so this is the, you know, this is in many ways is the difference, technology differences between ZOS and MVS. So 30, 40 years apart um, here, just a focus on getting, um, moving from batch to online at the time the MVS was released. And here in ZOS, is the focus is on security, reliability, availability, and serviceability. So you can take out processes while the machine is running. You can do all kinds of things while the machine is running, whereas here you have a much, much more limited environment. However, and this is kind of the central part of this video, you uh, running a ZOS, uh, even when you access it on, a, on somebody like a university or somebody who grants you access to it, or IBM also has a master the mainframe program where you can legally get from IBM a logon onto a ZOS, uh, it's nowhere near as fun as MVS 3.8. This amazing distribution by Jurgen Winkelmann, TK4, is such a fun environment because it has, I think, about 15, 16 different compilers. So if you ever heard about um, Snowball, if you ever uh, heard about, um, I don't know, RPG, if you want to learn Assembler, if you want to learn PL1, COBOL, this is a much better environment to do so. And and the, the central part, as I just said, is this. Everything that you learn here on MVS 3.8, you can use almost one-to-one -one on ZOS. Of course, you don't have most of the compilers that you have here on TK4, you don't have them on ZOS, even though you could copy them if, if the owner of the mainframe allows you. So the good thing is that anything that was ever written on the mainframe 30, 40 years ago will still run unchanged on today's most modern mainframe so if you have a compiler here let's say a pascal compiler that you like uh, you could copy it over to your account on the mainframe on zos and it will still run unchanged but uh here you have everything together you have the compilers you have the editor and you have all these additions such as uh, the ftp server all those things that you really need to learn the mainframe are present in tk4 and and the central statement that i'm making is this you don't need ZOS to learn the mainframe. You don't have to go through the effort of doing something illegal, you know, going against the license uh, agreement between IBM and the people who use ZOS um, and do something which could you potentially get you in legal trouble and uh, it cause you a lot of expenses to learn the mainframe. You can learn the mainframe on TK4. It's much more fun, much easier, much faster and uh if you know you, you don't have to learn aspects of zos which have nothing to do with with learning to program and learning how it works um all the all the aspects of running a modern billion transactions a day environment with many many hundreds of disks etc 
and all those uh, manageability aspects of ZOS have nothing to do really with running and learning MVS and learning the mainframe. You can do all those on TK4. So for all those people who want to learn the mainframe, you'll be well advised to start with TK4 and start to see if you really like it. It's a completely different way of working than Windows or Linux or some other main uh, operating systems that you know. But don't start from this one. Start from this. Start from MVS. And if you really like it, then you know, search for a way with a university or the master the mainframe uh, program with IBM, of which I will put a link in the description below this video, and then work your way up to, to those environments. But start with this. Uh, you have all the fun. You can run your own mainframe. If you do something wrong, you can just destroy it. It's only about 200 megabytes in size on the disk. You can just... Uh, make a copy before you change something so you can always revert back it's such an easy environment to maintain and operate and and, and has um i want to say 70 80 percent of the concepts of zos already exists in mvs 3.8 and you learn those and they're exactly the same between here and here especially with up update number uh, nine where we will have an ispf kind of environment you will be really almost one-to-one -to, -one to the mainframe and um, and you can have a lot of fun and don't have to uh, do anything illegal. So this is the tech part. Now let's go to the look and feel. So now let's focus on how as a user you perceive the differences. Where are the most striking differences between MVS 3.8 and ZOS? So first of all, the most important aspects of uh, look and feel is that derived from the fact that Anybody can go to MVS uh, to this link here, MVS TK4 ETH, and you arrive at this website and you can download a whole distribution. You take this one current, zip, unzip it, and within about three minutes you're up and running. Whereas, uh, of course, uh, having access to ZOS uh, requires you to ask somebody. So here you don't have to ask anyone. So that's the first important look and feel. I think the most important, which for me makes all the difference, I can just go here and download it. And uh, I don't have to ask anyone. Whereas here, I have to go find somebody who has a mainframe. I need to state my intentions. Why do I need it? Either you run the IBM uh, master the mainframe program, which gives you access to um, a ZOS system for a limited amount of time with very limited amount of restrictions. Um, I mean, with a lot of restrictions and or you go to your university or somewhere where they can give you an account and why they should give an account and it's totally up to them. And most likely you will also not have a full system privileges account. You will have a very strict account. Whereas here, of course, you're master of your domain. You're, you control your mainframe. You're the system programmer. You're the developer. You're the operator. You're everything. So here you get to experience the full mainframe experience because there is the IPLing, meaning the starting of the mainframe, uh, interacting with the console, uh, monitoring it, uh, shutting it down, adding users, all those parts most likely you will never get to do on ZOS because um, whenever they grant you account, of course, it will not let you just shut down a machine, restart a machine. Uh, you will just be a user who will be able to use COBOL and PL1 and uh, and uh, create uh, small data sets, limited in size, and that's it. So um, so this is of course the uh, the main difference. The other main difference is the access. Of course, MVS 308, you can only access by 3270 uh, 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 terminal emulator, such as the one I'm using here. I'm using the Vista uh, 3270 emulator by uh, bought, uh, Tom Brennan. Um, and uh, you can use the same terminal here, but you will actually, in with ZOS, you will never really attach to the channels itself because you're outside the organization. Here, the channels are emulated, so you can uh, connect directly to the channels on the processors, whereas here, uh, you actually connect with TCP IP. So the 3270 protocol is emulated over TCP IP, and uh, I want to say that in 99% of the cases nowadays, either you need to have a VPN or more likely you will have an SSL connection. So you will have to get keys managed, etc. So you can, before you even can connect. So here again, you can just launch it and connect to it. And in, in three minutes, you're up and running. 
Whereas here, you need to ask, and then you know they give you connection if they want you as a user. They give you a password, which you have to change. Soon after logging in, you need to configure keys so you can log in with with uh, SSL or TLS or something else, or sometimes VPN, and um, and uh, you will not be able to manage the whole machine. And sometimes you don't even get to see the whole machine. Um, at the university where I have access, I don't even see all the other users. I don't know if, if, it, if, if I am the only one there or a the, or hundred others. I don't get to see that because I'm not a system programmer at that, on that mainframe. I'm just a, a normal user on TSO for development work. So those are the most striking differences right from the get-go. The other one, of course, is that um, more deeper is that here everything is a little bit more refined. Um, you have... Um, you have 64-bit, uh, you have much faster disks, of course, much, much faster than, uh, than MBS 3.8. Um, but on the other hand, um, most, most ZOS environments that you will be able to access, uh, you will see that you just have the IBM environment and that's it. There's no monitors included, no performance monitors. Uh, no network monitors. It's just it's just the basic thing. Whereas here we have monitors. We have a lot of add-ons to make things a little bit more easier, and uh, a lot of things are automated, such as adding users, deleting users. Whereas here, when you know you you will not be able to play with all of that. So at the end of the day, what you really get different with ZOS that you don't get today with update 8 of MVS 3.8 is you have ISPF, which just a lot of people like. We have something similar, but not quite the same, but we will have it in update 9, and you have 64-bit. <laughs> and for most users who just have a limited account on ZOS, even if they can get one, everything else will feel so restricted, so simple that you will never have the fun that you can have and the learning uh, experience that you can have with TK4 because here you want to change a parameter for JS2 to see what it means or attach a new printer. You can do it here. You will never be able to do it. On ZS, they will never let you attach another printer. So here you have all those things that you can you can do which you cannot do here. Lately also, as you know, we also added a network job entry subsystem written by Bob Polmenter that gives you full access to uh, the worldwide HNet network, uh, which you see here. If you go to mbsprod.dynu.net, um, oh, what is it? Uh, so, um, can okay, I find it? Okay, I found it, so sorry. So if you access moshix.dynut.net, you will see here we have a worldwide network of about 80, 80, 90 mainframes all connected to each other. And MVS 3.8 is now also able to connect to this worldwide mainframe. We have many uh, such, uh, here is an example. Here's one in Germany with MVS 3.8. We have some digital mainframes and they can all talk on a protocol that existed already in the 80s called the BitNet protocol. And uh, we have a whole, so you just saw here, I have a whole environment where I use the uh, HNet NGE network to uh, provide all kinds of services. This is HTML, it just looks like it's ISPF, it's just a, it's just a normal uh, HTML, making it to look like a mainframe environment. But as you can see here, this uses the, uh, the NG protocol to talk to other mainframes in the cloud. And we are very busily exchanging files, chatting, and many other services that uh, you can see here partially, such as, uh, you know, we have Forex market, we have uh, real-time news, we have, um, um, I don't know, the energy market. You can see Brent is at 36 and WTI is at 35. Uh, we have weather forecast, let me put in here. Paris, and that will get so all this text um, based services for uh, our HNet network exists for MVS as well. And uh, you could conceivably make it to work with ZOS as well, but most likely the provider of your ZOS environment where you'll be given access will not have it set it up.
So whereas here you can set it up yourself and run it. So overall, the experience, the if, if, if you're coming to the mainframe to, to know what the mainframe is, you can get it from MVS. If you want to get to the mainframe because you want to learn how to use the mainframe and use COBOL or PL1, you can do it with MVS. Whereas here you'll have to see if they have the licenses for those compilers. If you're coming here because you are um, looking for a job in the mainframes, you can start to get trained on MVS and then you'll be ready to work on ZOS very, very easily. If you come here just to um, learn all those protocols, learn all those subsystems that uh, fascinated us 30 years ago, such as JES, such as uh, VSAM, such as all the access methods, if you want to learn assembler, then you can come to MVS 3.8. So at the end of the day, what I'm saying is you don't really need ZOS. Um, of course, if you, know, if you want to, of course, you should try to do it and get, have, uh, ask somebody to give you an account legally on a machine. But if you just want to do those things I described, learn or experience or just play with, go with MVS and you will do 90% or 80% or 85% of the things that you want to do. All the other components which ZOS has, which MVS doesn't, are things related to large-scale deployments and um, large-scale transaction processing and things that um, that don't really apply to running it on at home anyway. So I don't get this obsession with people running ZOS uh, at home because for what? It doesn't even make sense. Right? You can do all the fun stuff, all the things that are really interesting, you can do with MVS 3.8. And especially when Update 9 comes out soon, you will have a whole new dimension of things there. We will have uh, TCP IP headers and, uh, and libraries. So we will be able to do TCP IP de uh, um, development on C, on TK4. So, so many new things are coming. I, I want to say that don't don't waste any resources in trying to get ZOS to run illegally and get potentially in trouble with IBM and their lawyers um, uh, because IBM will be able to afford lawyers with almost without any limit, whereas most people can't. And so stay within legality, use a TK4, use MBS 3.8, and I guarantee you will have much more fun. If you have any questions about the things that we discussed here, please write comments below this video. Um, if you want to have, um, if you want to know how to set up your own TK4 uh, environment at home, I will link to a video or a bunch of videos that I made that describe how to do that. And uh, everything else, please post comments. If you like this video, press on the thumbs up button and see you soon. Thank you. Bye.